All right, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in once again to the Black Box Podcast, BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Well, on this channel, I had just gotten into a new case, and we were discussing the case of the Atlas Vampire Murder, which came to us from Stockholm, Sweden, back in 1932. And I was actually trying to get some more information about that, and one of the related articles that came up was just about the case of Annika Ersberg. And this was something that, you know, I just decided, I'll just glance at this, but I almost had that kind of gut feeling that once I read this, that it's just going to be like, boom, it's going to turn into its own upload. And yeah, so we're having a completely different subject as well. We're going to be talking about Anna Ersberg and the Stolen Meat Murders. An Annika Ersberg was someone who came over from Sweden to the United States when she was about 10 or 11 years old. And she didn't get along with her American stepfather, Swedish mother, American stepfather. The stepfather and her just don't mix, so she ends up running away. She gets star hooked on drugs, teen pregnancy, and ends up going down to a very short life of crime. One of the things that happens, though, is... She ends up with a guy named Bob Cox, who becomes her boyfriend, and they find out that it's profitable to sell stolen meat to restaurants, which I can only interpret to mean they're probably giving people a low-cost deal on it or something like that. But yeah, they're selling stolen meat to restaurants. One of these people was an individual named Joe Torrey, his name is spelled just like the manager of the Yankees, Joe Torre, T-O-R-R-E. And they met Joe Torre once in a warehouse. And Annika was pretending to pick up stuff out of the back of a truck. And then Bob Cox comes over they, and shoots Joe Torre. Once again, that's a very big thing to note. Annika did not pull the trigger. He shoots Joe Torre. They rob him. They steal his money. All right, that's one murder. Within a span of 24 hours, Bob Cox and Annika Ersberg are involved with a second murder. Their car breaks down, a police officer comes over, that's right, a police officer whose last name is Hellbush, he's just referred to as Sergeant Hellbush in most of the things, he comes over and Annika is pretending to look for her driver's license. Once again, she is the distraction, then Bob Cox shoots the police officer. He shoots Sergeant Hellbush. He is also murdered. And this is kind of what becomes the known... Well, this is what becomes the situation. Because they're like, what do they do with someone like Annika Ersberg? I mean, yes, she's apprehended, of course. They're just like, some people want to give her the death penalty. But they're like, she didn't actually pull the trigger. I mean, she was participating in the murders, that's one thing, and but she's not actually involved with the direct action of killing somebody. Moreover, they're even involved with a small shootout during the apprehension, and Annika is helping Bob Cox reload his gun, but she, again, she's not actually trying to kill the police officers. So, it's this enormous ethical question, it's like, I mean, it doesn't take Alan Dershowitz to tell you that the law can be tricky, the law can be messy, lawyers can play things around the way they want. Special circumstances, accessory to violence of this, that, and the other. Okay, lawyers can play around with stuff, but they're just sort of like, what do they do with this woman, whom I don't believe was an American citizen at the time, I'm almost completely sure she wasn't, because they had to deal with the possibility of extraditing her back to Sweden, but they're like, do they give her the death penalty? She didn't actually pull the trigger, yet she helped somebody commit two murders. And the thing with this one that they really noticed, the legal system really noticed, is that the murders were not for anything other than selfishness, profit, greed. They killed Joe Torrey for money. They, they tried to rip him off. They were conducting illegal business, first of all. They're trying to sell him stolen meat. They lie about that just so they can murder him and steal his money. I believe that the word that was used to describe this was trivial, but it's also just like selfish, greed-based. 
it that's the, that's what's going on here. This isn't some sort of civil disobedience that we're talking about. I mean, and it's definitely not one of those crimes where it's like there's actually some type of injustice going on and someone stood up against that and then they kind of uh, take their matters into their own hand. Vigilante justice or something like that. No. They killed a guy because they're, they're, they lured him on the false premise that they would sell him stolen meat and they killed him because they wanted his money. They, they killed him and robbed him. Next, within the span of 24 hours, they also killed a police officer. But the, but the thing is, Annika Ersper, the girlfriend, she's not actually committing the murder. She's just distracting the men while her boyfriend is pulling the trigger. So, I mean, like, as we introduced it right then and there, what would you really say about that? About that very little kind of thought experiment? Does she deserve life in prison? Does she deserve the death penalty? Do we need a death penalty in America? This is an enormous thing that we're going through right now because some people are like 4%. 4% of people on death row who are executed are innocent. I mean, that's kind of like a very small stat, but that's like 4 out of every 100, 96%, 4%. If 4% of people who are executed are innocent, is that a motivation to end the death penalty altogether? Because they're just like, hey, you're, you're executing numerous people who didn't actually commit the crime. Some people are just calling for the absolute abolishment of the death penalty. They are saying that it is inhumane. And moreover, that ties into situations like this when they would just be like, they would originally, I mean, like, yes, people were seeking the death penalty for Annika Ersberg because um, they're like, she, she might as well have killed them. She allowed for it to happen. It's not only she allowed for it to happen, she was directly participating in the murders. She just wasn't pulling the trigger. But I, I believe what happened was that she was originally placed on death row for a while, like, during the uh, sentencing, when she spent two and a half years in prison, she was on death row. And um, she wasn't executed, of course, and she was, um, not to give any sort of spoiler away, but, I mean, she was eventually sent back to Sweden. She's, she has a TEDx talk on this subject here on YouTube. So that's somewhat of a spoiler. But the thing is, though, Spent two and a half years on death row. They decided that if she didn't actually directly commit the murder, once again, accessory, yes, accomplice, yes, direct involvement, yes, if she didn't actually pull the trigger, she can't get the death penalty. That's another thing. And a lot of things that they were saying is just that the, pe the people of Sweden were actually kind of on her side about this when they were just like, once again, she didn't actually commit the murder, she was just the accessory and the accomplice, and they're like, other accessories and accomplices get way shorter sentences. And, like, she was dealing with 25 to life. But, of course, as we mentioned, she did a TEDx talk on this where she de details it all. She was eventually sent back to Sweden. The governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, at the time, yes, Arnold, was completely opposed with that. He, I think that was more about Arnold Schwarzenegger just trying to look tough. But, I mean, we have, some, we have a very big situation here. Did they do the right thing? A lot of people look at Annika Ersberg's character, and they kind of see that, oh, she seems rehabilitated. How, how long did she spend in prison? 28 years, give or take. About 28 years. And once again, some of it was in, like, solitary confinement, where she says, you know, there's no bed... There are no books. It's just like, um, there's not even a mattress on the floor. That was like some of the conditions that they had. And this is in the California prison system, mind you. Okay. 28 years in prison. Did she serve enough time? I mean, the victims' families probably would say no. But at the same time, is, is 28 years an appropriate sentence for someone who didn't pull the trigger, who was just kind of the distraction? 
she was distracting two men while her boyfriend murdered them. And also, I mentioned, though, during the apprehension, they were involved with the shootout and the police. She helped her boyfriend reload the gun. She helps this guy, Bob Cox, reload so he can shoot at other police officers. What do you make of things like that, of things of that intensity? She's definitely aiding and abetting. She is definitely a participant. Does it really make that much of a difference that she didn't pull the trigger? Or should this be something like, hey, that's not what happened. He's the murderer. She is not. He can get life in prison. He can get death row. She should not. I mean, the question that I would also like to ask you guys is, do you think that there's any sort of, um, any sort of reason that they had a harsher sentence for her because the first one was kind of definitely done for profit? We're talking about the murder of Joe Torrey, not the murder of the police officer, like the first thing where they're pretending to sell him stolen meat. And do you think that, that, that they have a harsher interpretation of this case because that was done purely for profit. I definitely noticed that there are certain senses of sympathy with someone. We mentioned about civil disobedience, vigilante justice, where a woman is being abused or something and she murders her abuser and people are like, no big deal, let her go. I mean, it comes up in the headlines from time to time, right? But this one was something quite different. It was a scam. They were already doing illegal behavior. I mean, they already found out how to sell stolen meat from, to people at restaurants below cost for profit. Lots of criminal behavior from Annika Ersberg. Not to mention the um, anything associated with the drugs. Do you think that the... Um, that because that this was a kind of very heavily motivated crime to get financial gain that they probably wanted to um, have a harsher sentence for her. It's possible, but at the same time, I mean, anytime somebody's involved with the murder of a police officer, a lot of people in America are going to be very sensitive around that subject. I guess we've kind of approached this subject in a different way compared to some of the other cases here on BVOR. Like, First and foremost, do you think we should have a death penalty? I'm just asking you. We gave, kind of gave a couple sides of the story. I mean, we mentioned 4% of people who are executed could be innocent, but we also said there are heinous crimes out there. And also, I mean, murdering someone for profit, like murdering someone just so you can rob them and steal their money, does that justify the death penalty? That's kind of like two questions at once, like um, sort of trying to say that should there be a death penalty at all? And the second one, this is more about the uh, boyfriend, Bob Cox. Do you think that he deserved the death penalty? Remember, he fired the, he fired the shots at Joe Torrey and Sergeant Hellbush. Did he deserve the death penalty? And also, where do you draw the line when it comes to something like redemption, um, rehabilitation, when someone has been completely rehabilitated and they're ready to come out of prison, parole, all of those things. Like, when do you think that happens? Jamie Foxx did a movie called Redemption where he plays like a guy on death row. And, um, you know, we were talking about it once years ago when that came out. And, I mean, it's about a guy who takes up writing or something and is expressing his views and such. And they think he's a completely re rehabilitated person. And one of my... Uh, classmates at the time who also saw the film was just like he wrote a couple books so what he committed murder so what I mean, kind of different perspectives going on but the issue is annika ersberg didn't commit the murder and it's like i mean or say she didn't commit the murder she didn't actually do the killing she's the distraction so we have that giant question of what do we do with that what does the American justice system do with somebody like that? And that's why I wanted to do this upload, because I think it asks a lot of questions, and it's very challenging. And another thing, though, is American justice system versus the justice system in Sweden. Do you remember when Anders Bering Breivik, the Norwegian bomber, was sentenced? He killed 77 people in uh, 2011, right? He was sentenced to 21 years in prison. In the Nordic world, the prison sentences really are not that um, 
they're much shorter than the American prison sentences, and spending 28 years in prison is a very long sentence for a Swedish national, and some of the things that they were kind of saying in response was just that she served more time in prison than almost any other Swedish citizen, like, and that's their claim, almost more than any other Swedish citizen. I mean, if you're talking about a guy who murdered 77 people in Norway, mind you, that's Norway, not Sweden, he murdered 77 people, gets 21 years, she was the accomplice in two murders, and gets 28 years, like, where do you draw the ethical lines? I mean, I can flat out tell you, I mean, I can tell you what I believe, 21 years for the massive murders and the Norwegian bombing in 2011, that's way too short. I mean, somebody did the math about that. It's almost like, it's almost like four months for each victim or something like that. It's ridiculous. Because, I mean, that's what Anders Bering Breivik did. He challenged the system and they recognized that maybe the sentences are a little light. On the other hand, though, are the American policies too strict? Like, what do you think about that? This, this is one of the cases that really kind of gets you to think about stuff because we're talking about Annika Ersberg now. Because it, it kind of goes through that gray area. And someone once said that through the gray area is where we really learn about life, is when we really explore humanity. But, you know, like, I mean, you can find a lot of information about her online, Annika Ersberg. And I highly recommend listening to her at the TED conference. I believe it's TEDx. The Swedish School of Economics, it's just written S-S-E. And, you know, she's talking about all of this, and she recognizes that she made a mistake. She got hooked on drugs, heroin to be specific. She had a, she was, she had a, a son when she was only 16 years old. He ended up dying, actually, when she was um, 26, I believe. Her son died, and lots and lots of tragedies all coming together. But what do you make of her... Cr her involvement with the crime. I think that this is just something very, very big to kind of share to the youth of the world. The murders that we've been talking about, the murder of Joe Torrey and the murder of the police sergeant, happened within a span of 24 hours. And in those 24 hours, everything is over. You know, it's like life has been thrown away. I mean... Once someone crosses a line like that, there's no going back, and actions do have consequences. Well, what do you have to say about this case? Completely different style upload that we've done on this. Not so much putting forward a theory, just kind of the ethical questions that we have going on here. What do you think? And I would love to hear from you. If you have anything to say at all, please drop a comment below.